This is Twit. I have the pleasure of sitting down here with Andreas Weigand, author of Data for the People, which is the book that I've been pouring over for quite a while now. It's a fantastic book. Also founder and director of the Social Data Lab. Uh, formerly, you were chief scientist at Amazon, which we'll definitely get into because I'm sure that was a, a fascinating foundation for the book. And also you have a PhD in physics at Stanford, artificial intelligence, machine learning. I mean, all of this stuff is so top of mind right now. Anyways, it's really great to sit down with you today. Great to be here, Jason. Thank you uh, for joining us. So, um, yeah, I mean, I feel like the, the last couple of years when we're talking about artificial intelligence and we're talking about big data and neural networks and how it's all colliding right now, I feel like, yes, these are terms and these are concepts that we've been talking about for a very long time, but I feel like right now at this point in time is an inflection point where things are really shifting in a, in a major way and we're starting to learn how this new world order works with access to such incredible tools like these. What do you think about that? I absolutely agree. It is the point where several things come together in history that we have enormous data sets because whatever we do, we create data about our actions. Mm -hmm. We have enormous tool sets, compute power that allows us to analyze this data. We have more and more of the skill sets that people are able to actually come up with predictions, with insights from this data. So what's left? What is this decision point? It's the question of mindset. Are we going to have the mindset to use the data that we create for the people? Or is there a mindset that, if in doubt, we'll use it against the people for the industrial military complex? So that is why I wrote the book. I want the data to be used for the people. And that's what we're going to talk about. <laughs> absolutely, absolutely. I mean that's a that's a big I think that's a big ask, right, of of companies that are have such access to so in, like such detailed information about how we live our lives. I, I have to imagine like they, you know, it's, it's part of their competitive advantage to keep that information as tight to the chest as possible. There's just so much of it. Big data, I mean, is so big, it's almost inconceivable. Um, so it's, it's in some ways, as I was, as I was reading through the book, in some ways, it's hard for me to understand how the, the companies who are collecting, harvesting, managing all this data to create their competitive advantage, uh, how we find ourselves in a place where they are willing to let go of that control a little bit, or at least open open it up so that people on the other end whose data is being shared with them are you know can have access and, and manipulate that data on their own. You're absolutely right. It's not the size that matters. It's what you do with it. <laughs> the motion of the ocean, as you say. <laughs> Uh, so, uh, in in your what what drives your fascination with big data? Is it just? I mean, you've you've been involved. Like I said, you were uh, formerly a chief scientist at Amazon. And Amazon, when you think of big data, like there aren't many companies that are much bigger than than Amazon as far as putting all of that data that it's harvesting around users to play. You know, as far as uh, how, what what products are suggested, what people you know, what people's fascinations and interests actually are based on their their buying patterns, all that kind of stuff. What what fascinated you about this to begin with? I've always been interested in the data people create. How the data we create can help us make better decisions, better for ourselves. Mm -hmm. So in the 80s when I was in college, I was very interested in psychological tests. What can we learn about people? Then also I was very fortunate that in the 80s I did my undergraduate thesis at CERN in Geneva. And that was a time when the beginning of the web was to be seen. So that notion that we can use data to collaborate, to work together on problems too big for any individual to solve, that sort of was really what got me excited. I then went to Stanford to do my PhD, and initially I wanted to do it at Slack at the Stanford Linux Accelerator Center, because that's where they had the largest amounts of data and the biggest computers outside the defense. And then David Rummelhart, one of the people who invented neural networks, he came to Stanford and he was in the psychology department. And he really was one of the people who best knew how to understand people through the data they create. 
And neural networks is a way of formalizing this, of coming up with algorithms that learn from data. The time hadn't quite come yet because we didn't really have all that much data that people create in everyday lives. Think about this. In the 80s, there were no mobile phones. Mm. So we didn't know the geolocation of people. And even there was no web at that stage. So we didn't know what people clicked on. We had very little insight into the decision-making process of people. But we saw it coming. And so for me, it was just absolutely wonderful to be able to do my thesis with him on building neural networks for prediction, for time series prediction. And then after my thesis, uh, Wall Street was very interested in whether that emerging technology in neural networks could be used in some way. So I sold all my consulting time for one year for Goldman, then JP Morgan, Morgan Stanley. And it was pretty amazing how Wall Street was one of the early adapters of technologies because they had data. Mm -hmm. And they specifically D.E. Shaw, David Shaw, was, I think, one of the pioneers who realized that whoever has the better data will have the better results. And then after looking at the traces, traders left on Wall Street, then the opportunity came along that Amazon called, had had a call to ask whether they wanted to be Jeff's chief scientist. And as the chief scientist at Amazon, we could also look, of course, not only the traces traders leave in the world, but the traces people leave in the decision-making process when they buy things. And then after Amazon, I've worked with a number of companies on geolocation data, on data which people create even outside the shopping process, outside the web. And the deep questions that has is, in this world where a billion people think about themselves differently from before, hmm. think Facebook, where a billion people think about knowledge differently from before, think Google. And of course, where a billion people think about buying things differently from before, think Amazon, Alibaba. What does the future look like? How can we build a future based on those data that actually helps us and doesn't hurt us?